Okay. Uh, okay, so we start this session. Maybe we will have a, a welcoming speech from Toshi. Yes. Toshi, do you want to have a two minutes welcoming okay. speech? Yeah, good afternoon. That We're going to have a third webinar of the, uh, with the head of the, uh, some IVAS members from Europe. We will have uh, six talks in the first session, seven talks in, in the uh, uh, second session, which all talk about uh, the cow power uh, mechanics, as mechanics. Uh, then we will enjoy uh, this webinar. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> okay, we start. And uh, so we start from PC. PC is the uh, uh, founding of the APWA. And he will give us a talk about uh, many invasive management for scaffold and union. PC, please. You see, we cannot hear you. Okay, so we have a uh, Can you see the screen now? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yes, yes, it's okay. Go ahead. Okay, let, let me start again. <laughs> so thank you very much, um, everyone. Um, uh, it's always my great pleasure to be able to uh, speak uh, at this uh, special Apple webinar. So I started the talk about the minimal basic management of a SCAFA non-union, uh, the state of the art. Uh, I think the uh, SCAFA uh, fracture management uh, is strange, <laughs> sorry. Uh, the screen is a bit strange. Let me let me restart. Sorry, I don't know what's happened. Uh, I stop share and then I restart. Restart. Okay. Hope this is this time is all right. Okay, that's better. Yeah, I think um, the principle of scaffold for non-union surgery has been well and. Um, Established and then as, as uh, presented by Dr. Nagel, I think some principle uh, we have to surgically manage a surgical non union. We need to correct the malalignment, have the adequate deployment, exposure of the um, of the fracture site, and then good bone grafting and stabilization. I think that sort of principle actually governs so far on the scaphoid non union surgery. But of course, most of the time in the past, we are talking about open surgery. But actually described by uh, Tim Davis and his uh, team is that uh, in a very big uh, meta-analysis of about, uh, more than 140 study uh, involving uh, 5,000 more cases, actually they have defined that in fact, uh, globally, there are no difference between the union range of those uh, cases treated with a non vascular bone graft and vascular bone graft. And of, in the presence of the AVN, there may be some difference between the vascular bone graft, which is actually can help in 74% of patients of, uh, of the union. So, um, but as we has just um, uh, see this uh, paper, uh, this uh, important study by our good friend Scott Wolf actually did a very meticulous um, uh, study on these uh, 35 patients of non-union with all sorts of evidence uh, looking at the vascularity from MRI, interrupted bleeding, and even histological analysis. And you found that even in this cohort patient with more than 50% uh, of patients has evidence of ischemia, but in, in fact, just by simple, simple cancer bone graft and screw fixation, they can achieve union in 33 out of 35 in 12 weeks. So to him, actually, um, this recap of the uh, vascularity of the, of the proximal pole may be a good fixation, good bone graft can already heal most of this non-union. I think that is actually very important um, scientific support to the concept of the minimal invasive surgery. 
Because if you can actually perform this even in less invasive way, you have least disturbance to the um, biological environment, the ligament, the vascularity. You can have actually a much better chance to get a very nice union, not only the union of the bone, but also an improvement in the functional outcome of the patient. The arthroscopic bone graft concept, I think, I believe it started in my hospital back in 1997. Um, this uh, series actually uh, in the tw first 20 years have managed around 128 risks with the median follow-up of 26 months. In fact, we can achieve an overall union of about 89%. There's still, of course, like every series, there's still uh, some failure, but um, not all the cases will require revision surgery. And we have tried to an analyze our different factors which may affect the union, but ultimately only one factor, only one factor will affect the union, and that is the proximal fragment bleeding. If intraoperatively you can see poor bleeding, no matter how much we deploy, we have a less chance of union, but still got around close to 80% of union chance, which is not bad. But if we can actually see a very nice bleeding from the proximal pole, basically you have a very high chance of union over 90%. So I think that is the only silver factor. Timing is not an issue. This is case we managed 27 years age of non-union, not very good blood supply of proximal pole, but with adequate deployment and bone grafting and fixation. No problem to achieve very not uneventful union and also a correction of the uh, collapse. This another case, even more uh, significant, 40 years non-union and with a history of gouty arthritis. So interestingly, even after 40 years, um, although we see a very mobile non-union, but the articular service can still be quite good, although there's also evidence of some sort of um, uh, gouty arthritis pleasant, and the, and the, and the non-union is very, very sclerotic, but no problem with patient, you can deprive the bone until you can see bleeding. So after 40, you can still have the bleeding. What we need to do is just to put the bone into a nice fixation and adequate bone graft and pack it. And there's no way, uh, no, no problem to achieve a, a good bone contact and put a bone union. And even after one more 10 years of time, there's a definite evidence of union, although in this patient, they're also because, perhaps because of gouty arthritis, they also end up into some sort of partial risk fusion, but no problem, patient no pain, still enjoying very good function. So over the past decade, actually the ABG is utilized much more widely, thanks to Jeff, Jeff Koo actually found that there's actually many publications and many centers already practicing this. And in terms of the lumbar publication, publication there's also an increasing trend. So, See, in, in our um, um, uh, um, home country in China, actually, Dr. Bo Liu, actually in, in Beijing, they performed 70 cases, all 100% union. And in the south, in the Shenzhen area, between 2013 and 2017, 25 cases in Dr. Zhao Ji's uh, center, all united. And then Dr. Tang, uh, one, um, one of the, um, the earliest hospitals in China practices, 30 cases, uh, all united. How about in Japan? Actually, Professor Tsubogawa is another pioneer in Japan utilizing this concept and published paper as early as 2009. He used a little bit different method from mine, but actually also achieved very good results in many different types of these given. In Korea, which is one of the earliest practice in the bone graft, back to 2008, and you can see 97.7%. Cases and within a short union time of around two months. Subsequently, many people from Korea also published in the Troy. I think one of the important work is a paired outcome between the Kong and Okong. Actually, they show that there's no difference in the union rate, both in the general hardy, although in the APG group there's a little less correction of the carbon, but that's no clinical setup. In the Taiwan group, uh, uh, Dr. Xi has actually also practiced this as early as in 2006, and he did it in this uh, type 1 into type 2, 3 type of non union uh, with uh, no proximal ABN. He have a bone graft from either the disorders or either crest, achieved also a very good outcome in union of 88.6%, similar union rate. And a good friend, uh, Ju uh, Pen uh, Wong and uh, Yi Chao, actually, I think Dr. Wong will also present some of his experience later on. There are also, in the latest series, also very good correction, even in the patient with unstable non-union. There's no problem correcting the alignment back to more to normal, and just from the isolateral radius. Over at our friends in the European country, in France, Professor Matalin has actually performed 
a very good result. Using these surrogates as the donor site achieved very good union. Only one out of the 35 case failed to unite it. And there's also achieved very good, excellent function outcome and grip strength. Um, Dr. Uh, uh, Cognac in um, Paris also performed uh, published papers in 2017. Uh, again, he used seeing this sort of um, the trify a marrow biopsy needle, just taking from a disorder, it's very minimal invasive technique and achieved 100% union in all of the 23 cases. In Iran, Dr. Frala also performed 70 cases, 100% union. In Spain, Dr. Pagado <coughs> also th performed 13 cases, 100% union. Uh, using this of, of, of trick, using a, 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 a insulin syringe to inject the, 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 the bone graft into the joint as a very good checks uh, to perform this type of surgery. In Norway, Dr. also performed uh, this type of surgery with 100% union. In Denmark, Dr. Novik <laughs> compared the ABG with the peritoneal fixation and found that although the ABG take a little bit longer time, but they heal faster. The healing is amazingly early, 7.8 weeks versus 10.5 weeks. Finally, in Australia, <laughs> Jeff Edgar did a great job here. He actually tried to compare the Russell uh, bone graft and the leader femoral condyle. And actually, compared to that, there's a short operating time by 33%, but a chip similar range of motion and union time. And in fact, the union time, the union rate is very high. And he has more tricks to convert the KY into the uh, skew at about six weeks of time. Very good um, tricks onto that. So overall, I think that, that in the future, we were just talking about more accurate assessment in the surgery. Actually, people have been using the 3D tracking system as a navigation to help to do a more accurate surgery, and also intraoperatively using intra and ultrasound to look at the carbon vascularity. Mm -hmm. So when the using the 3D pinning technique to do a very precise and even a little more invasive surgery to the scaphal non union situation, and thank for uh, Wendong's uh, slide. I think he will talk a little bit more about this topic in the later on as a more elaboration. And in, in Hong Kong side, actually my colleagues, uh, Dr. Mack, he had been using the 3D panning technique to correct even malunion in a very precise manner, uh, combined with the interoperative navigation guide control in actually and achieve very uh, good uh, reduction and correction. Again, Dr. Mack will describe this technique in more detail in the second section. Our chairman, Dr. Bolio, it's a very amazing using the, uh, the locally designed robot to assist in the very precise fixation in the scape on the unit. Again, this is, will be the trend to go uh, to, because this will actually much improve the accuracy of the surgery in the near future. Healing agents also help. Uh, you can actually using our other um, um, artificial agent to help healing like the BMP2. Uh, also using the stem cell can actually help this healing. Like actually, the BMT2 has been first uh, pro, uh, promoted by Dr. Neil Jones in 2005, but there's not been any competition. But using BMP2 concept, you can um, use and using abdominal into the atherosclerotic manner, uh, but even you can uh, avoid the using of the autogenous uh, bone grafting site. And by using this, you can completely perform the surgery totally under local anesthesia, under perfect direct vision and control, and to fill up the space with the BMP2. Adequate fixation, and you can actually see that this patient also can heal very quickly with also excellent clinical function. And I'm sure that Dr. Toshi Lakamura will be going to share more explain about the BMP2 in the subsequent talk later on. So, um, uh, this is a case with a 10 years of non union symptom for three years, and you can actually see that actually the scapular cavity is very athletic, but the patient's not. Oh, so we decided to perform the ABG, but at the same time, inject with <laughs> Not only the fracture heal, but actually the <laughs> for large, and the patient has excellent kind of power function with the, uh, and the pain. So I think there's another way to open the future. So ladies and gentlemen, I think actually this earlier this year, we, we, uh, I also gone through a very interesting um, uh, uh, talk in the Australian Hand Society that talk about has our super bone graft and fixation make open grafting and vascular bone graft almost obsolete. I think we almost can come to a conclusion that I would, at least I have a conclusion that after the 24 years of practice, I have a feeling that ABG perhaps will be the universal solution for scaphoid non-union, despite all occasions. And there's already some evidence now. So last but not least, I would like to welcome all of you to uh, join the meeting in Hong Kong this year. We will have um, our annual meeting, the webshop and webinar in December. 
we have a very good um, uh, uh, overseas uh, speaker panels together with a local uh, speaker. So I hope they will be bringing some sort of new information and excitement to all of you. Finally, thank you for all the kind invitation. Uh, we are continuing to see the growth of the APWA and with uh, your uh, continued support, we will have a bright future. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, PC. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, we will leave all the discussion as the, as, as the final part. And uh, we will we can, uh, welcome Greg Raban from Australia. He's our past uh, uh, president of uh, APWA. Greg, please. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me clearly. Um, so this is on new concepts uh, of assessment and management of uh, carpal instability. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge uh, Simon McLean and also Melanie Amasaria, who's been involved with some of this work. So uh, when we look at scapholunar instability, we're used to using plain X-rays, but really maybe clenched fist views with uh, dynamic assessment and moving assessment may be more appropriate. <laughs> After all, uh, we want to have an understanding of the kinematics and it's not just a static instability. Really, this is a, an instability, which is a dynamic phenomenon, which uh, is important for the functioning wrist. So if we look at this example here, where we're looking at an axial image of a 4D CT scan, we can see that the scaphoid is subluxating off the back. We can see some small osteophytes here, and we can see the obvious widening of the scaphoid interval. This, these images here are STL file creations from a 4D CT scan and comparing this to the cadaveric uh, specimens. We've looked at the isometric point of the dorsal aspect of the scapholunate interval. I must admit I always thought it was here, but it's a little bit more radial and probably reflects how the dorsal scapholunate ligament and the dorsal intercarpal ligament both provide stability to this interval. So we now change the position of our uh, insertion points for our anchors for stabilisation of scaphoid instability to make it more radial than what we've done in the past. Two injury where you have the translocation of the ulna and you have the instability of the scaphoid and, and a wide diastasis. Clearly, this is a more difficult thing. So it's almost like this middle version has instability of the scaphoid and this has instability of the scaphoid and of the lunate so that it's, it's a, clearly a much more complex injury. And we published some years ago uh, an example of a patient who had a dorsal dislocation of the scaphoid. So this is another example. So really there's, there's quite a spectrum here of scaphoid instability. It's not just a simple scaphoid instability injury. These images here represent proximity mapping of where the scaphoid and the radius, how close they are. And so, for example, this dark area here may represent uh, less than half a millimetre and the light blue one would be, say, two millimetres. So if we have a look at this in real time, this is uh, what with, with a patient moving the wrist, we're able to map out where the contact pressures are in the normal patient and with scaphoid instability. We can see that scaphoid instability, it tends to be more radial and uh, often a bit more dorsal. It's interesting when we look at this up example at the top, where although that there's um, some widening at the scaphoid at interval, we can also see that when it comes together, there's pretty well total contact at that level. And finally, that uh, the example I was just going to show just had some degenerative changes over the radial styloid. And we know from clinical experience that as soon as you get any narrowing of the radial styloid, that's abnormal. I'd like to share with you some work we've done on uh, Keenbox disease. And we can see how this lunate is widening, and we call this internal lunate instability. And uh, it's interesting, we've identified a number of cases that also have an associated ulnar translocation of the carpus. If we look at this axial specimen, we can see that the, uh, the lunate sits here with a short radiolunate ligament, and we've got the um, lunotriquetral and scapholunate uh, ligaments. So we refer to this as uh, intrinsic instability with Keenbox disease. This is another example that's an interesting case where we can see this patient's got this fracture on the, on the volar aspect of their lunate. And if we look at the axial image, we can see that this uh, cortex is attempting to break and the ligaments remain attached to them and ultimately we're going to lead to an instability of that lunate. 
In comparison, when we look at this example with an avulsion of the volatile linate fragment and a larger piece which is now impinging, we have examples where this, uh, this fragment is completely locked and preventing movement of the, of the carpus. So this is some of the spectrums that we've been able to identify. So with regard to Keenbox disease, we think of it as being having an intrinsic instability and also a type of extrinsic instability. So this is where the central column uh, collapses after the fragmentation of the lunate. The radial column collapses as well. And that we end up getting this dorsal intercarpal ligament remains a little bit lax now and the whole thing's collapsing down to and lead to ulnar translocation of the carpus due to an extrinsic instability of the carpus. And this is the type of example we see here. We've obviously got this fragmentation of the scaphoid and of the lunate, sorry, but we've got this whole translocation of the carpus. And finally, we've been able to do some mapping of the, uh, this is where the, uh, the third metacarpal passes in radial to ulnar deviation of the wrist. And if we look at the motion of the scaphoid, we can see the scaphoid follows the, um, the, the capitate and the third metacarpal in ulnar deviation, but not in radial deviation. There's an outer plane motion of the amount of scaphoid motion. The scaphoid is actually going to a lot of flexion and then extension, leading to out of plane motion of the scaphoid. So we feel as though some of the concepts we've developed may be of value in the future, but we really haven't sorted the puzzle out yet. But I think we're a little bit closer, and now we have a method of being able to assess that. And finally, how do I approach it? Well, I think for the dynamic instabilities, I think Mothelin's technique is a good one. I think for the patient who has a, a, a static instability, we still like our tensionable suture anchors. And for those where this carpus is completely unstable, then I think Michael Sandoz and Fab technique may be of value. Thank you very much. Can you hear that? Uh, thank you. Yes. And don't you? Okay. Can I be the chairman? Yeah. Okay, please. Okay. Uh, the next uh, speaker will be Toshi Nakamura, and he will talk about the uh, new concept on uh, treatment of stage three Cambex disease, free bone pack graft. Toshi, please. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, well, I would like to talk about uh, uh, stage three and stage four Kimbok disease treatment uh, with a radial shortening with a bone pen fixation to the segmented uh, lunate bone. Okay. So Kimbok disease is uh, osteonecrosis of the lunate. Um, I in my opinion, that the cause of the Kimbok disease is coming from the blood supply disorders, which is like uh, ischemic situation, then uh, with an or the edematous situation with the donate, and also microfracture due to the repetitive stress, which we call this one as a carpenter disease. But uh, to my understanding, that Kimbok disease is still mysterious disease to handle it and also diagnose it and treat. Um, we actually have the Lichtman uh, radiographic uh, stages on that. Uh, stage one is osteonecrotic, the lunate only found with an MRI. Uh, stage two is uh, osteonecrotic uh, situation, which was found on the radiologic situation. Then stage three A shows on the segmentation of the donate stage 3B. Uh, the carpal malalignment is uh, obvious uh, with a rotation of the scaphoid. And then uh, in stage four, uh, we found the collapse of the donate with a degenerative uh, condition. And the Kirk Watson causes scar crest. Then uh, treatment option for adult Kimbok disease is uh, uh, 
normally the stage one is treated with conservative treatment. Stage two is, uh, we Japanese normally adopt this one to radial shortening. Then there's some guys doing the vascularized bone grafting or the captate shortening that Greg actually did, uh, uh, described in the last year in the journal of surgery. Uh, for stage three and stage three B is rather difficult. Normally, vascularized bone graft uh, is applied to the stage three A in uh, in some describes that for three B a partial bone fusion or the proximal local pectomy was indicated. Then uh, in a stage four with uh, Kimbok disease, then uh, donate uh, excision with a tendon ball by a carol or PLC partial bio fusion or total bone fusion was applied in this uh, uh, stage four. Uh, especially in the stage three and three B, uh, the, the net shows the segmentation, then a cow power height reduces, then showing the rotatory, rotatory rotation of the scaphoid and with the cow power alignment. So uh, treatment uh, in this stage is quite difficult. Uh, before 1999, that we actually did an a tendon ball insertion by a carol technique, but uh, uh, we actually found that the cow power malalignment, malalignment and also that uh, reduced grip power. Then uh, we also that some patient added the STT joint fusion that can also show the reduced, uh, reduced range of motion of the wrist. So after 1990, since 1999, we actually did a radial shortening of stutomy with the fixation of the segmented lunate by a bone peg from the radius. Then in the stage 3B and 4 uh, Kimbuk disease, we apply a bridge type external fixator for eight to 12 weeks to correct malalignment of the corpus and to maintain the donate height. Uh, this is a case series, uh, then uh, 55 wrists in the 54 cases were underwent this surgery. Then uh, we are, my case is a little bit different from others that uh, female is uh, much dominant compared with the male. Then uh, age average is 37 years uh, from the 17 to 65, 65 years. Then uh, at least uh, three years follow up at the right. Then uh, uh, we found that uh, Richtman 3A stage in the 12 wrist, 3B in the 38, and then the stage four in five wrist. So the technique was the first thing we showed to the radius. Then uh, some patient we applied an arthroscope to uh, check the condition of the lunate segmentation. Then uh, taking from the radius that uh, we've taken a bone peg, then uh, uh, that was inserted into the lunate bone in an open fashion. Then uh, in a stage three B and four, uh, st uh, stage three B and four, bridge type external fixator was applied for eight to twelve weeks to correct the malalignment of the lunate. You can see a bone peg here, and also bone peg here. Then we evaluated the vascular uh, bus range of motion grip power recovery to the original work, Lickman functional evaluation, donor's evaluation of the work abilities, modified mayo risk score, then the X-ray and the MRI findings, especially focus on the carpal height ratio. Then a, a surgery was uh, radial shortening with the bone pig fixation in 14 list. Then a 41 list we apply an external fixed. Bus was reduced from 88 to 13. Range of motion was uh, closely the same, relatively loss of uh, flexion and uh, increased extension. Grip was uh, uh, recovered from the 50% of intact to 90%. Then uh, we found that we actually obtained 100% recovery rest. The occupation was a heavy manual worker in 12, light manual worker in uh, 11, housewife at 21. Then the all of those are recovered to the original job. Then recovery period from the surgery was 11 to 12, 24 weeks. Then 
Dickman's criteria, we actually have a 51 satisfactory result, four indicate non-satisfactory. Then uh, we obtained an, uh, 42 excellent, 13 good result in the donor's criteria. However, the modified mail risk score obtained a five excellent, 22 good, one free, and two poor clinical results because of the range of motion than uh, grip power. Uh, color power height ratio showing in a uh, um, 34 wrist in a uh, 55 wrist. Then preoperatively, uh, CHR is 0 0.5, 0 0.48. Then recover to the 0 0.56 in immediately post operation. Then that uh, post of four years and two years to four years showing the 0 0.54. And uh, 33 risk among the 55 risk indicate and recovery of the MRI T1 signal. Uh, post you can see a the right slide showing the recovery of the T1 signal in the same patient 3.3 uh, years after surgery. Uh, this case was a 50 year old male office worker showing uh, the stage 3A. Uh, Kimbok disease showing the uh, low signal intensity on the lunate with a uh, segmentation of the lunate. Then uh, we actually did an, uh, uh, this surgery with a shortening of the radius with the bone pain fixation. Then two years after operation, then the copper height ratio is uh, relatively uh, smaller, but the grip strength uh, was recovered to 14 kilogram to 40 kilogram. Uh, 19 years old Porter, which is a light manual worker, showing the severe segmentation is a, uh, on the donate. Then this was categorized in a 3C by a Greg. Then we actually did a bone peg fixation. Then uh, you can see a uh, 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 union of the segmentation of the donate. Then uh, grip uh, is uh, recovered to the 22 kilogram to 40 kilogram. Copper uh, height ratio was recovered. However, that he shows an, uh, a loss of flexion extension on the grip. So in discussion that we actually did a carob uh, surgery with a tendon bone insertion. However, that uh, we actually have uh, many crops of the corpus, reduced grip power. Then uh, with an STT fusion, uh, showing the severe restriction of the range of motion. Uh, since 1997, that we actually did uh, this surgery, then uh, the compression surgery with radial shortening uh, with a fixation of the fragmented lunate obtains a uh, relatively excellent clinical result. Then uh, in our stage 3B and 4, then a bridge type external fixator was applied for 8 to 12 weeks to necessary to reduce the malrotation of the corpus and to maintain the donate height. That can show a, a little bit this, uh, restriction with the friction extension motion of the wrist. However, that clinical results were excellent. And also that uh, you can see an union uh, of the segmented to donate. Uh, if we do not apply an external fixator, then uh, two years after surgery, unit, unit was collapsed. So in a stage three and four, then we need an external fixator for this surgery. Couple of height ratios was recovered. So in summary, the technique and clinical outcome of the radial shortening with a bone pain fixation for segmented unit in stage three, A, three B and four Kimbok digits. Then favorable clinical results with a radiological recovery of the crops donate union of the segmentation are obtained. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Toshi, for your work. And uh, I'd like to invite the next speaker, which is, uh, who is uh, my co-chair, Wen Dong Su. He will talk about um, 3D printing assisted percutance fixation for scaphoid pathology. Wen Dong, please. Okay, thank you. Can you, can you see my slides? Yes, I can see it. Okay, so I, I will start. And uh, we are talking about uh, the scapula to, uh, to fracture. So, because we are a little bit late, I will skip to uh, 
so the PSF is a very often used to to cure the scapoid fixation. And the both uh, dorsal and water approach of the PSF of the scaphoid fracture has been described either using the standard water approach or the trans trapezoidal water approach. The fixation procedure is a challenge. Uh, uh, usually, the essential place of the gallery was not was not. Uh, and often requires several times uh, of during attempts uh, with the help of the intraoperative uh, uh, CP. So, uh, since the 3D printing technique has uh, developed, the many patient uh, specific guiding plates has been designed to perform in orthopedic surgery. It became uh, precisely and easy. So, in some in these methods, the bone was exposed and used as a contact surface of the patient-specific guiding plate. In the PSF procedure, the scaphoid would not be exposed. However, the surrounding skin of the wrist with the proximal part of the sun as a whole was a characteristic shape and could keep a relatively constant uh, spatial location for the scaphoids, which could be used in the contact surface of the guiding plate. So we use uh, the design two modifying techniques. So when is for accurate scaphoid fracture and uh, for scaphoid ununion. Uh, this is a, this is a accurate scaphoid fracture. Thirty-six year old male, right wrist uh, four injury five days ago. So X-ray showed no obvious displacement of the scaphoid fracture. CT reconstruction showed a fracture line at the wrist of the scaphoid. So this is the process of the guide plate designing uh, as following. The equity scaffold fracture case and the CT scans and CT data were reconstructed. Plate was designed in a 3D software, printed and then used in surgery. Uh, this is a CT data reconstruction procedure. Both the shape of the bone and the skin were in illustrated, and uh, an axis of guide. Guide wire was designed according to scaffold and then combined with the skin. The guide plate was designed which includes a water part, a dorsal part, and a tube for the guide wire. This is the video of the wind shot procedure. Before the procedure, uh, procedure standard wrist arthroscope was performed. <coughs> And after that, the traction was uh, removed. The guide, guide plate, including the water part, dorsal part, and tube, were uh, put, put on. Then we use a KY drilled into the scaffold very slowly to avoid KY bending. And then we check the guide wire position we use the CP to see the guide wire position is very good then this is the first operative evaluation the, the angle and of the guide wire and the, the screw is very good so this uh, study was published in the journal Hand Surgery, a medical edition. The Arthur's ABG technique, PC2, uh, first uh, have advanced this technique and uh, in the first talk, he gave us a very briefly and uh, global uh, 
retrospective to, to see uh, this technique has been widely used. So we also we can see uh, in the patient with the scaphoid union, we start with the RCT study. Uh, it's uh, group A is uh, the number is eight, and the group B also the number is uh, eight. We use the surgery is a 3D printing PSF plus ABG, and uh, the, uh, compare with the CM CB assistant the PSF plus ABG and do the evaluation. This is a male, 41 years old, and he, it's, uh, he, uh, he can remember he got a twist injury 20 years ago, and uh, so the wrist pain for two years and limitation for the RON. MRI. This MRI showing the obvious type of fracture with many is placement. CT scan was performed to acquire uh, 3D data. Besides the natural position, extension position is also scanned with the spot of the short sprint. This position could make the trapezium move to the dorsal side. There is the design of the guide plate in a uh, 3D scheme. After bone reconstruction uh, of the plate, three axis of fixation was designed. According to the skin surface, a uh, continuous guiding plate was designed. So this is the video for the of the procedure. Also, scope checking of the ligaments showed good quality. The TFCC is also go, uh, okay. The ununion site of the scaphoid was found, and uh, we use the three D printing guide plate assist the KY drilling as it was performed, which is a similar with the case of the acute uh, scaphoid fracture. Put on the plates and drawing a 3K KY slowly, and then the guide plate was put out. Full scope was also used to check position of the KY. In the astroscope, all the tips of the 3K Y was uh, were found right in the proximal pole of the scaffold. Then the KY was uh, uh, retroscoped to the fracture site to facilitate the astroscope removing of the, uh, the bed bone. And then you, we use the ABG technique. After that, a small tube. Yes, this will trans, and we also use the cover with the glue. So compare with the uh, pre-operative CT scan, the scaffold gets a uh, union in the post-operative six months. So this is the uh, RCT uh, results. So results show that the average bone operate, uh, operation time in group A was shorter than that in group B. The second outcome, including range of the motion, muscle strength, functional scoring in group A is similar but is slightly better than in group B. Uh, also, we published in the journal of uh, orthopedic translation with the detailed information. So, in conclusion, 3D printing is a quite fantastic tool to assist in the, the sur surgeons in the treating both the acute scaffold fracture and the scaffold union. In uh, finally, we have a, a very quick Hong Kong Hwasan joint course and workshop of the wrist arthroscope every year in Shanghai. This year will be the 10th anniversary in, in November and combined with Aqua uh, Congress. All of the wrist lovers are welcome to join the event. Thank you. Thank you, Wendong, for the interesting paper. Uh, now I'd like to invite the next speaker. Uh,
is uh, Shanlin Chen, and he will talk about current concepts and my favorite procedure for scaphoid nonunion. Shanlin, please. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's my great honor to share my some experiences in scaffold non-union. Because I noticed there are several speakers who will introduce uh, the method for scaffold non-union from the different view. And also because the time limitation. So this time I plan to introduce my preference for scaffold non-union only. And there are uh, various bone graft methods stepped onto the historical stage successfully, which include materials bone graft and a bed bone graft with rigid fixation and a pedicled vascularized bone graft, such as 1 2 SSRA or free vascularized bone graft, uh, such as the bone graft from the medial, con medial femoral condyle, and also the bone graft under wrist arthroscopy. And all these methods still play their role well until today. And for myself, actually, I tried almost each of them uh, during the past 20 years. For example, the pedicle vascularized bone graft and one to SSRA, and the union rate over 90%. And this patient is a 45 years old male. You can see the bone def defection is very clear here. So I used the one to SSRE and the X-ray after two years after treatment and bone graft. And the range of motion of the wrist joint is uh, good enough. And this is a young guy also. A, I used the one to SSRE. The range of motion after operation is totally acceptable. I also tried free vascularized bone graft uh, from the Medial, con medial femoral condyle for the refractory scaffold non-union and also provide a obtain a very good result after operation. And I tried bone graft under wrist arthroscopy for more than 15 cases. The union rate also you know, over 90%. I trust this is a very good method for scaffold non-union especially at the proximal part uh, of the scaphoid. Actually, each of the above methods could be used for all kinds of scaphoid non-unions. And all methods could provide the patients with the union rate over 80%, according to the literatures, and over 90%, according to my experiences. So which one is my preferred method? As the ABG, white bone graft from Waller approach, uh, perhaps a very traditional method. Why? Because I thought it is easy to perform compared with the other method and with higher union rate always. Um, for my 49 cases, the union rate is almost 98%. And use this method, we could expose the non-union area uh, very easily and adequately, and it could correct the handbag deformity effectively if you think it is important. And also, no need to worry about the bone graft, the vascular, vascular, vascularity of the bone graft exists or not after operation. So, case one is a wrist scaphoid in our union with handbag deformity. You can see after operation, the x ray demonstration is nearly normal and correct the humbug deformity. Case two also is a, a wrist, uh, is a scaphoid non-union uh, with humbug deformity. We, I performed fixation with three key wires. And before operation, you can see the capitate and lunate angle is increased. And after operation, it's nearly normal. So the range of motion, the function of the wrist after Three years operation is very uh, good. Case three is also used this method. Six years after operation, the X-ray demonstration, the range of motion of the wrist, 
and case four is a 38-year-old female with a history of more than 30 years. And 10 years ago, he, she received a bone graft from the radiosteroid in the local hospital. But the result was not good, and the um, non-union reoccurred. So we used this same, same uh, technical. And after operation two years later, you can see the X-ray is very good. And then the scores of the wrist after operation was also improved. Case five is a 28-year-old pianist. Because of a scaffolding union, he couldn't play piano very well, so he felt very bad. And he received two times uh, reconstruction in local hospital, but all both uh, procedures are filled finally. So I used uh, this method and fixed the scaffolding non-union with lax screw. And two years after operation, the function, you can see the range of motion was very good. And the scores of the uh, injury wrist was improved significantly after operation. And he felt very you know, happy after he can play piano the, um, the same as before his, uh, his injury. And I sent the radio to me. I'm also very happy too. And the K6 is a 16, uh, 90 years old, uh, 90 years old young guy. And you can see the bone defection here. And also the fragmentic uh, demonstration at the distal part of the scaphoid. So for this young guy, I always remove the distal part of the scaphoid. But this patient and his parents insist on to maintain the integrity of the scaphoid, help me to reconstruct the, re the scaphoid. So I still use the same method. You can see three years after operation. And the x-ray was very good. The function of the wrist also very good. So discussions, both the scaphoid fracture and non-union are challenge problems for hand surgeons and giving credit to a lot of great works so we could understand the functional anatomy and the kinematics and kinetics better. So the treatment outcome was improved slowly and constantly after that. So there are many bone graphs methods in our hands which could be divided into two types. The one is the ABG, the other is vascularized bone graft. So each of the methods has its own advantages and disadvantages. So for me, it seems that the key point for the treatment outcome depends much on the doctor's capability and the technical detail instead of the method itself. So we propose our strategy for scaphoid non-union. So you can choose different method uh, according to the types of the scaphoid non-union. So wedge bone graft from volo approach with rigid fixation became my favorite procedures because it's an easier method with higher union rate and the satisfaction rate always. The crucial points of this technical include it could remove the ischemic or necrotic tissue completely. It could pack the cancerous bone to the cavity after debris as adequately as possible. So we can uh, use it, using screw fixation as long as possible. So it doesn't mean the other procedures are exclu excluded from my practice. So finally, Please permit me to express my whole heart thanks to some tutors who help me um, not only in the technical but also the knowledge, a lot of knowledge in the field of wrist joint and of course including the scaphoid Naomi. That is Joe Slay and PC Ho and Marcelin and Alexander Sheen. Thank you all. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Xianlin, for your comprehensive review of your uh, expertise on the scaphoid non-unions. So now we have a uh, last speaker, uh, Abhijit Wahegaonkar, and he will talk about savage procedures for a snag wrist. Abhijit, are you ready? Yes, I am. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to contribute to this webinar. And uh, my task is just to talk on salvage for snack risk. So we all heard about these wonderful procedures to 
to try and improve the But then every now and then we will come across cases where the scapegoat just refuses to be and we have the neck risk if the treatment is not initiated. So the natural history of scapegoat non-union has very well been studied and described by many authors. And then uh, we all know that because of the displacement, there is uh, carpal instability and eventual arthritis. And this very nice paper by Lindstrom and Nystrom from Sweden showed that there is a 100% incidence of osteoarthritis about 10 to 17 years after the diagnosis of scaphoid non-union uh, that is untreated. So uh, again, uh, this paper was, uh, uh, is a landmark paper, is cited very often. Uh, and then in about 93% of ununited fractures, you would see the incidence of OA 10 years down the line. And there's a very predictable pattern of evolution of arthritis uh, with 95% of the degenerative joint disease of the wrist having a very scaphoid pattern. Uh, and then the initial uh, joint to be involved is a radioscaphoid joint followed by the capital lunate joint. However, the radial lunate joint somehow seems to be spared. And then there's triscape arthritis. So the clinical presentation of patients with uh, a snack wrist include pain, swelling, a restrict restriction of movement. There may be a catching or a popping with loss of grip strength and crepitation. And then the, the stages of the snack wrist also are very well known to all of us from stage one to uh, stage uh, uh, four. And uh, four is when there is pan arthritis. So what this is a very typical presentation of uh, an early snack wrist. Uh, you can see that there is an established non-union with, uh, with very radio-dense uh, lines at the fracture non-union, and then the arthritic changes in the radius k joint. And of course, there is a uh, DC deformity that is also seen uh, because of the flexion of the scaphoid. And these are different stages of uh, arthritis that one would see with uh, snack wrist evolution. The goal of treatment of uh, snack wrist is to provide pain relief while maintaining stability, strength, and mobility. And it could range from non-operative to operative movement uh, management. Uh, and then, of course, the stage of the uh, snack wrist is very important in determining what kind of treatment you would like to offer your patients. The general recommendations for stage one are either a styloid excision, uh, which could be performed open and arthroscopic, or with uh, bone graft and oral scaphoid uh, for the scaphoid non-union, stage two wrist denervation, uh, scaphoid excision with mid carpal fusion or a proximal row carpectomy, and stage three uh, would have anything from a scaphoid excision to a, a partial wrist fusion or, or a total wrist fusion. We all know about uh, the arthroscopic management of uh, snack wrist, and my mentor, Professor Mathula, has come up with very uh, uh, innovative ideas about treating these uh, uh, conditions with an interposition suspension ligamentoplasty uh, along with the radial cellulite. I mean, we'll hear about that shortly, I'm sure, uh, but uh, I'll not belabor too much on this. This is a radial cellulite. This is an example of a proximal row carpectomy, the principle of which is essentially to convert a hinge joint, uh, a link joint into a simple hinge joint. And of course, there are caveats to that, which I'm sure all of us are well versed with. And we all uh, know uh, the different uh, procedures that one would like to uh, resort to for treating these problems. Partial wrist fusion will comprise of either a two corner, three corner, or four corner fusion, depending upon the surgeon preference. Again, can be performed arthroscopic or open. Uh, we also have these uh, different implants ranging from staples to headless compression screws and the uh, spider plates, which will help in uh, accomplishing the union or fusion. Uh, we all know uh, the open procedures where there is uh, a, an extensive arthrotomy with scaphoid excision and a four corner fusion, but uh, we can use minimally invasive techniques while preserving the biology and uh, providing uh, the similar outcomes with minimally invasive techniques. Uh, this is again an example of uh, a arthroscopy assisted partial restfusion. Uh, the outcomes uh, of these procedures have been well described in literature. 
the range of motion to be expected after radiocarbon fusion is about 45 to 40, 40 to 45 percent of the opposite side, whereas with the mid carpal fusion, it is about 58 to 70 percent of the opposite side. None of these procedures are without their share of complications, which may range from non-union to pay, incomplete pain relief, a progressive arthrosis, spin tract infection, osteomyelitis, nerve damage, and then rupture, which should be uh, warned, the patient should be warned about these uh, complications and these problems. The comparisons for proximal drocarpectomy versus spoke on effusion, again, have been described in literature by Peter, Peter Stern and his group. And uh, they are enlisted on the slide for, for your reference. I'm not belabor too much on this. They looked at their complications as well, and they found that uh, provided that the procedure is performed in a, a proper indication with the proper technique, these, uh, these complications can be minimized. Uh, wrist innovation is also a procedure that can be offered for patients with snack wrist where there is good wrist mobility. Uh, on the dorsal aspect, you would uh, denervate the articular branches of the posterior interosseous nerve, the radial sensory nerve, and the dorsal sensory branch of the ulnar nerve. And on the volar aspect, we have the anterior interosseous nerve, and you would strip the periosteum distal to the pronator quadratus and uh, do a, a denervation uh, that is complete. Uh, here is a brief video, but I'll just run through this video to show you the uh, different uh, nerves that are being transected. This is the posterior interosseous nerve. We remove a segment of the uh, pronator of uh, the posterior interosseous nerve. The anterior interosseous nerve is then also addressed uh, through the volar approach. And uh, we have the sensory branches of the radial sensory nerve and the ulnar sensory nerve uh, that are being uh, denervated. And only the articular branches. This is the radial sensory nerve giving off articular branches to the wrist joint and the CMC joint as well. So you need to uh, be very methodical and very meticulous when you're performing uh, the neurectomy. Anteriorly, you want to be sure that the motor branches of the anterior interosseous nerve are, are preserved. So it is recommended that you do not resect any more than uh, uh, proximal uh, two centimeters from the wrist joint. Um, the periosteum from the radius distal to the pronator quadratus is stripped off with electrocautery, and that would again give denervation effect to the wrist joint. So this is a brief video. And of course, then we have the option of performing a total wrist arthrodesis, which is a well-established and proven technique, which provides reliable pain relief while providing a stable wrist joint. So in summary, uh, non-operative treatment can be tried, but of course, with evolving arthritic changes, you would have to resort to some sort of a salvage procedure that has been described in this talk. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to contribute, and uh, any questions, I'll be happy to take. Thank you. Thank you, Abhijit. Uh, uh, the, the, the final uh, discussion will be moderated by Wendong. Wendong, please. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So, any question from the from the to the speakers? Um, yeah, may I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, PC, uh, please. Thank you for all uh, the speakers. Are wonderful. Talk. I have uh, some question for Tosi because uh, the, the 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 method you present is very um, interesting and very different, but you can actually achieve a very good outcome. Just a few questions. Uh, uh, for the learning, do you do the debridement before you put in the bone, uh, the bone pack or you just pack the bone into the limb? Uh, the, the recent case is that I actually debride in arthroscopic fashion, then I put in the bone pack. But uh, most of the cases, I just put in the bone pack without any debridement. I see. So you think, uh, because sometimes I believe the necrotic bone may cause pain. Mm -hmm. sound. So that's why I, for me, I try to remove it. Um, but maybe, maybe it's not necessary. So if you want to. Yeah, that I think I agree with you that segmentation uh, scenario can cause the pain. And also that amazing reason mm -hmm. that uh, dead bone within a dead bone peg actually obtain the union of the segmentation in almost half of the cases. Yeah, yeah. That is quite interesting that still, I think that the, the still necrotic lunate has an viability to uh, to reunite. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, if the situation is uh, 
getting worse uh, within the crops of the, the carpus, that can also make an, a segmentation it's a little bit wider. So that is why that we put an external fixator to crop uh, correct on the marrow alignment. Uh, can I just one more question, it's about the shortening. Well, I see um, some case you show that the shortening seems to be quite minimal. So I, actually, I don't know what is your principle, how much you're going to shorten the, the radius. <laughs> that is depending on how much uh, the minus variant of the wrist. Then most of the cases are the neutral variants. So that is why I just cut it. Then I make a bone peg in a longitudinal fashion. So if it's a neutral, uh, a neutral, on a neutral, you just cut very yeah. little and use it as That's a bone cut. Uh, so what is very little? One millimeter, two millimeter? Uh, there is the most minimum one is only the braid, braid, uh, braid width. Then uh, uh, that, that was the report from the Argentina that uh, a quarter compression was actually cutting the bone, actually increasing the a blood supply to the lunate, and yeah. I still believe it, so yes. that's, that's why that I cut it. Okay. Okay. So you're not, you're very, actually how much bone to be cut? Cutting, the process yes. is already yeah, good. So, that, so that is depending on the uh, uh, on the variance of the risk of the patient. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Very welcome. I have a question uh, to... Uh, gentlemen, gentlemen, so we, we should uh, ask a new door. Uh, shall we shall we can start uh, continue discussing or we have to close it and uh, move to sesh, session two yes so so the yeah, time is running so quick so i'm not sure uh, after the webinar uh, uh, did you did you do you have any other things after the webinar no uh, no okay so so uh when done properly we we can allow one or two last questions in this session then we we'll proceed Okay, we, we still have, okay, we have uh, two questions, two last questions. Anybody? Yeah, you. Uh, I have a question to Greg. Uh, Greg. Greg. Okay, uh, you you're just talk about uh, widening between the scaphoid and triquetron. Uh, is it the cause of Kienbeck or the results of Kienbeck disease? What I mean by that is that the, if the there is a ligament uh, instability, uh, such as the DIC or tear. Uh, it, it may increase the pressure on the lunate. They may result in the back. So I just wonder. Uh, if so, so what we've found is that uh, quite a few of the fractures uh, of the lunate are right adjacent to where, where this uh, scaphalunate ligament or lunotriquetral ligament would insert. So this makes it like um, not a true ligament injury, but it's effectively like a, a ligament injury. So it's like a scaphalunate ligament injury, but without the scaphalunate ligament being torn. So it's that's an intrinsic type of instability um, of the wrist, but also the whole wrist just tends to collapse down. And so we've seen some ulnar translocation of the carpus, and we think some of that's a little bit like the concepts of an extrinsic ligament injury. So... Uh, it, it's an interesting phenomenon. I think we're still learning exactly how this fits together, but I'm, I'm confident about one thing, that it's it's more complex than we first have, than David Lippmann taught us. And I think now we should be starting to think about Keenbox disease as a type of carpal instability and not yeah. see it just as a bit of a fragmented lunate. I totally agree with you that uh, that might explain that the, some type of Keenbox uh, progress very rapidly. And those uh, some other things are very uh, slow. So yeah. that may difference may, uh, is comes from the ligament instability, I think. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Okay, guys, we have one question. We can have one question, one more. <laughs> really? There's a question, there's a question from YouTube. Anyone have a question? PC, still. Yeah. I see there's no other. Uh, I want to ask I went on you, you, your good self. Um, uh, your, your technique is wonderful, but uh, in case of there's a displaced fracture or non union, uh, would your technique also apply? And if so, uh, what is the tricks? Uh, how, to, how to cater for the displacement uh, of the scaphoid? Uh, it's a good question. Yes, actually, we 
uh, we choose this uh, patient uh, uh, has uh, no displacement or very small displacement. So otherwise, because the technique is not uh, so neutral, so so I do not want to make <laughs> make the make the surgery more difficult. So we choose the not uh, no no dis uh, displacement only only union and uh, easy to do the ABG technique. Thank you. Okay, so uh, it's fine. And uh, so thank you all. We will close this session and uh, uh, go to the next session. And uh, the moderator will be Dr. Shi and uh, Andrew Chen. Yes. Uh, you are. Yeah, good afternoon. Yeah, so this, the second section is the innovative procedure. Yeah. We have the seven topic and the uh, seven experts, including our guests, and uh, from the euro. And uh, I will, uh, I, and uh, Angel will uh, moderate a relative each topic. I think the each topic should be have the seven minutes because the time is so so tight. So uh, to control your time. So the first topic is uh, uh, Professor Lee. You know that he is our Secretary General. He serves the Catholic University of Korea, uh, his division of hand upper, upper extremity. Professor Lee, please. Thank you uh, for introducing me. I'll, I'll try to make it short, very short. Mm. So I'll talk about the two screw fixation technique for scaphoid fracture. Um, Scaphoid fracture has been uh, known to be difficult to treat because the patient sometimes neglect the injury as there is a very uh, minimal pain. And the scaphoid is notorious for its scanty blood supply. And there are some issues with decision-making when we choose the proper surgical options for this fracture. We all know that the classification system uh, suggested by Dr. Herbert uh, type 2, A, uh, A2 is incomplete fracture, B1 is oblique fracture, and B2 is a complete fracture pattern. Differentiating this fracture pattern, especially between A2 and B2, is very important, and as they look very similar in the radiographs and CT scans. So if there is any doubt in stability, I suggest to fix the fracture percutaneously. And we may need a stronger construct for the community fracture and all the non-union of the scaphoid. It has been well known that the central placement of the screw in the scaphoid increased fixation strength up to 40%. Another interesting research reported in the literature that the fixation stability is increased when the screws screw is placed perpendicular to the fracture uh, rather than central placement in type B1 oblique fracture. To place the screw perpendicular to the fracture line in type B1 oblique fracture, uh, the screw has to come from the dosal side, as you can see in the uh, figure C, the red line. And the green line indicates uh, the screw uh, direction from the volar side, which is not ideal for the ovaric fracture. So uh, if there is a B1 ovaric fracture, it is recommended to place the screw via dosal uh, approach, uh, as, you look, as you can see in this CT scan, or uh, the two screws uh, from the volar side. Uh, recently, a smaller headrest compression screws has been introduced and putting two smaller screws become an option to increase the fixation strength of the scaphoid fracture. A biomechanical study published in 2018 revealed that the two screw fixation construct is as strong as plate fixation and twice as stronger than single screw fixation construct. There's another uh, biomechanical study showed that the two screw fixation 
has the best rotational stability compared to the play fixation or single screw fixation construct. Their biomechanical advantages of the two screw fixation technique has been proved clinically in this case series. They achieved 100% union with two screw compared to 86% union rate with the conventional single screw fixation technique. This is one of my cases. A 26 year old female came to my clinic with continuous pain on the anatomical snow box uh, 12 weeks after initial injury. CD scan showed uh, proximal to waist fracture of the scaphoid with cavitary bone defect. So I decided to put two screws from the lower side to increase the fixation stability of the scaphoid non-union. Bone graft was not uh, used in this case. Post-operative CD scan showed location and trajectory of the screws. I usually put one screw uh, to the volar side of the scaphoid and put another screw to the dozer side via trans uh, trapezial approach. These are final follow-up radiographs. Non-union non was achieved uneventfully after one year uh, surgery. Although it is difficult, two screw fixation can be possible via dozer approach for approximately one third uh, scaphoid fracture. So in conclusion, although A1 and A2 fracture can be treated conservatively, I recommend the percutaneous fixation uh, for the A2 fracture if there is any doubt in stability of the fracture. And I recommend two screw fixation for B1 uh, oblique type fracture and the community the B2 fracture. Uh, it, as it is a more stronger construct compared to the single screw fixation. Thanks for your attention. Well, uh, thank you very much, Juyak, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, next, I would like to introduce uh, none other than our chairman of uh, today's session, uh, uh, Dr. Liu Po, who will be talking on uh, robot assisted fixation for scaphoid fracture and fracture dislocation. Uh, to you, Liu Po. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay, so time is very limited. Uh, my seven minutes, we're talking about the robot assisted fixation for scaphoid fracture or fracture dislocations. Uh, so we all know that the uh, scaphoid percutaneous fixation of scaphoid fra fractures, I believe most of the speakers here actually think himself or herself is a magic pursuit. Actually, it's, uh, usually it's not a very complicated procedure. Uh, many of you may have uh, experienced that you have a, uh, to just one, one shoot is okay and quick procedure, but it's, it is always true. Sometimes it's not. It's not the case uh, in the clinic. We continuously uh, see the patient with uh, a complication of uh, the uh, male, uh, male practice of the fixation. And the complication rate for percutaneous fixation of a scaphoid fracture is as high as 30% from the uh, literature. And our friend uh, uh, Scott Wolf from uh, New York actually has uh, put a sentence in his uh, one of the papers that a seasoned hand surgeon can struggle to accurately place a percutaneous screw safely within the scaphoid. So it is, uh, this is one of my patients. Actually, uh, um, you can see multiple attempt trial and 106 fluoroscopy images taken to achieve an accurate placement of percutaneous screw fixation for a single patient. So why some, uh, sometimes percutaneous fixation is not a piece of a cake? Uh, first of all, you know that the anatomy, the tortuous shape, and also the safe zone in the scaphoid when consider uh, the uh, diameter of the screw, actually the safe zone of the uh, screw fixation is just a two millimeter. And uh, like in this case, uh, it seems it's a, the screw is well in the bone, but actually when you scope in, you find a two millimeter error already lead to a disaster. 
And also, you cannot see the scaffold when you do a percutaneous approach, like the uh, circus knife throwing, without seeing anything. And also, we all know that scaffold is moving. So uh, it's also, you know, the radio deviation or the deviation flexion extension actually uh, each, uh, each different position scaffold is in dif different uh, 3D alignment. So how to make sure a good block always go around you with you when you do a percutaneous approach? So of, of course, uh, robotic surgery is a possible new solution for many of the uh, procedures in orthopedic surgery. And we have the robot for the soft tissue and defense in Europe. And also we design a, a robot for the heart tissue in Beijing. So first, first the, this kind of a robot was designed for, for the spine surgery or, or surgery for the large joint. Uh, however, the, the successful uh, application of these big, uh, big bones actually is not necess necessarily uh, produce a, a successful procedure in a, in a small bone, in the tiny bones. We know only that the from big bone to tiny bone is never a simple zoom out. A lot of quest, a problem may occur. There, there, there uh, would be lack of a peripheral hardware, like the fingers of the robot, and also lack of the surgical plan, planning software, like the, the brain of the robot. And also a lot of problems like operating time, complex steps, and the radiation accuracy, etc. And now, friend uh, Dr. Shanin Cheng actually has uh, used this robot for in the uh, hand surgery uh, procedures like uh, uh, vascularized fibular grafting for avian femur head. In this uh, uh, scenario, this uh, robot is used uh, in a, also in a large bone. And we start the cadaveric study from uh, 2016 uh, to, to make sure the robot could be used for the tiny bones. This is our uh, cadaver. You can see the simulation is the left and the rear movement, movement of the robot on the right. And when you uh, decide the right position, trajectory of the screw and the robot may directly go to the, the specimen. And you, the accuracy was uh, validated by Cadero study, and after that we uh, start to do the uh, start the clinical study from 2018. You can find this is a real setting in the operating room. This is a this is a robot. It is a still static robot arm with six degree of freedom, and the, this uh, the patient has a patient reference frame here, and the robot has uh, the uh, robot uh, reference frame uh, here, and you can see this is a optical tracking device, which is, this is like the eyes of the robot. So the, the robot can see everything in the, uh, in the operating room and know the uh, position of the robot arm and the position of the patient. And also we have the 3D, uh, 3D philosophy unit, like the 3D CT scan in the operating room. And we have a surgical planning uh, workstation, like the like we, when we drive, we have a navigation, uh, we have a map for, for, for the for driving. And the, after the surgeon uh, actually uh, selects the uh, right entry point and the trajectory of the screw, and the, the uh, trajectory of the screw can be checked in 360 convenient sagittal axial and coronal plane to conform the optimal 3D position of the screw. And then, so, so what, what, what you need to do is just uh, press a button and the robot will do the job for you. The job will go directly to the to the right position you you would like the job to go, and you just uh, follow the route of the robot and putting the screw. So our study is between uh, January and September in uh, 2018. Patients, off patient, off fracture was undisplaced uh, undisplaced fracture, and the main operating time was 14 minutes, uh, including. Uh, uh, 18 minutes of setting and 22 minutes of operation. All patients uh, has a, just a single guide wire insertion attempt. So you can see the outcome. So you can see actually the uh, AP and the, uh, and, and, uh, and the lateral view, uh, the uh, position you, the, you select in the intraoperatory uh, in, is exactly same as the post-op uh, uh, images. 
so this is our uh, paper. This is a first reported uh, reported uh, clinical uh, uh, paper for scapular fracture with robot assist assistance. Uh, also, this uh, robot actually uh, now has uh, this, um, developed to a multi-functional uh, uh, device, which is uh, can be used for all the uh, location of the uh, human uh, the skeleton. So more step forward. Uh, so uh, after the uh, initial uh, uh, small success in the non-displaced fracture, we 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 uh, actually now are thinking about the. Uh, display scape of fracture, perennial nerve fracture dislocation, subacute fracture or fracture non-union or partial risk fusion, and so on. So this is this is an example we use a uh, we use a stoppy assist reduction in the temporary fixation for transcapular with perineal nerve dislocation. This kind of uh, grossly displaced fracture, uh, fracture actually we all know that we now we can use uh, a stoppy to help us to reduce the fracture meaning invisibly. And then we temporarily uh, uh, hold the uh, position, and then we can uh, proceed to the uh, robot assist uh, percutaneous fixation, uh, both for the fracture, uh, scape of fracture, as well as the uh, dislocation of the couple bones. So the robot can help you to allow you to uh, accurately go to the right location and orientation you need with best biomechanical benefits. You can see. Uh, uh, the robot can help you to, to go to the uh, right position, uh, which you think is uh, with the best um, uh, biomedical benefits. So probably we should find something more interesting for surgeon's hand during the operation in the future. This is, a, yes, this is our dream, but uh, we know that uh, sometimes uh, the future is already coming. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Robo. Give us a so nice lecture. So I have invited the next speaker, uh, Professor Mark. Yeah, he is also service in Prince of Wales Hospital, Hong Kong. And he gave a, today he gave a title is the Azure School Manager of Escape of Mount Union. So uh, Dr. Mark, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Bali and Andrew for your invitation. So my topic will be on a computer navigated uh, treatment of scaphoid malunion and non-union. Um, as we all know, uh, the, there is bone resorption in scaphoid non-union, and indeed in the malunion situation, this uh, malunion will result in um, in the malalignment of the bone, and this affects the whole wrist as well. Um, although we know that the uh, the direction of the angulation of the bone is quite predictable with extension, supination, and translation of the proximal fragment, resulting in uh, a lot of the time DC deformity. Uh, the amount of bone loss is not always uh, uh, predictable, and uh, it has been estimated to be around 10% in most of the cases. Uh, however, the size and the shape is variable. So anatomical reduction may be difficult even with arthroscopic assistance or with the Lynchide maneuver. This is the close technique of DC uh, deformity correction using Lynchide maneuver. First, uh, 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 KY is driven into the lunate and the wrist is extended to uh, uh, to correct the flexion deformity. However, this is correction in one plane with estimation of accuracy by fluoroscopy. There are uh, open methods of uh, 3D imaging guided reconstruction of the scaphoid uh, using uh, uh, 3D printed um, PSI uh, published in 2016. However, this looks like very extensive dissection and is quite nightmarish for us uh, arthroscopic surgeons. Uh, since the ABG uh, was developed in 1997 by Dr. Ho, uh, we have been thinking, is there a way to further improve uh, the um, uh, anatomical realignment in the uh, in a non-union and malunion situation while keeping it minimally invasive? So uh, we have developed a, a technique using uh, computer-assisted preoperative planning at, in the first part with intraoperative navigation and arthroscopic bone grafting in the second part. And actually, both parts are equally important in the uh, precise um, execution of this, uh, of this surgery. In the first part, we plan it. Uh, we try to determine where the osteotomy should be and the bone defect. And this is done in, the, uh, in our... Um, uh, software called Mimics, 
and uh, the second part involves pinning and the aim is to pin the proximal scaphoid to the distal radius making them as one unit using titanium KYS to reduce the amount of artifact and in the second part two KYS are inserted into the distal pole a uh, 3D image is acquired uh, this 3D image is then fused to the pre-op CT image uh, within the software mimics and, the, and this this is actually the most important part of the procedure and how it actually works uh, because in this mimic software we try to extrapolate the two pins uh, into the proximal pole while it is matched into the contralateral normal side. So we assume that in the normal side um, these two pins will then be extrapolated into the proximal pole thus uh, aiming to achieve the uh, normal anatomy. So then navigation is done and the pins are driven into the uh, what is thought okay uh, or planned to be the correct position and actually during the uh, navigation uh, the probe confirms that the accuracy is actually quite acceptable and this is the result of the 3d model and in two cadavers we uh, found that the uh, accuracy is within 0 0.5 millimeters so it's uh, still acceptable so this is the first patient, 19-year-old boy, a basketball team player, a school team player. Uh, he, pre he had injury in September and presented to us in uh, mid-November. And by December, the bone has already healed in malalignment with uh, CL angle 37 degrees, SL angle 90 degrees. This is pre-op. The range is quite good, but there is uh, persistent dorsal radial wrist pain. And this is the uh, humpback deformity. So uh, within MIMICS, we, uh, we tried to determine the osteotomy site and the, uh, the difference in height was estimated to be 5.5 millimeters from the contralateral side. This is the bone graft site. And actually within arthroscopy, we could not uh, easily identify the fracture site because uh, it has already healed, but this took some time to do. Uh, uh, the first part was to do the Linscheid maneuver, correct the DC deformity, and then pin the scaphoid between the distal radius and the capitate. And osteotomy was done under navigation. And um, the two pins were, uh, this is the os osteotome, which was also a uh, navigation guided. Uh, the osteotomy was made and the two pins were driven into the, um, into the proximal pole and note that I tried to make the two pins as proximal as possible to preserve more space for putting bone grafts in. And this is the intraoperative arthroscopic video. The malunion was taken down. Uh, fibrous tissue was removed. The bone was debrided as in the usual way in ABG. Graft packing was done and finally fibrin glue was applied. And this was two weeks post-op, uh, at which the radiolunate pin was removed. At 12 weeks, all the KYs were removed. Uh, at seven months, the bone has healed quite well. Uh, the, um, the alignment is uh, quite acceptable. And comparing to the pre-op, uh, the, both the CL and SL angle has uh, improved. This is at one year, four months. And he was able to return to the basketball court and shoot again with his uh, wrist. Another case, 30-year-old young man, uh, foot injury while playing soccer. He injured his wrist in October and presented to us the next year, okay, uh, six months down the road. So again, a quite severe DC deformity. And in fact, because of the malalignment, there was some carpal instability as well at the SL region. Uh, there was stiffness of his right wrist. And this DC deformity was actually irreducible. Uh, even at maximum flexion, the lunate could only be brought just to neutral position. So uh, a breakdown of the uh, scar tissue was needed uh, within the arthroscopy. So again, pinning of the scaphoid between the capitate and the radius, and this is a radial lunate pin to perform the Linscheid maneuver, and this is the tracker in the distal radial area. Uh, this is how the... This is how the bone was corrected in the software with reduction of the collapse, the flexion deformity, and the pronation deformity. 
Again, the two KYs were extrapolated into the proximal fragment, like so. The osteotomy was done uh, by navigation guidance. And the two pins were, this is the gap after the osteotomy was performed. And the two pins were driven in to the proximal pole, bone graft put in, and the final pin was inserted. Uh, this was at six months after radiolunate pin was removed. Uh, I actually converted the KY into a screw uh, to have uh, earlier um, uh, aggressive rehabilitation and range of motion exercises. So the DC deformity was well reduced in this case compared with the pre-op image. So as conclusion, non-unions and malunions can affect the whole wrist. Uh, computer navigation can help you to permit uh, permit, uh, permit a minimal invasive approach to correction, tell you where to do the osteotomy, and avoid overstuffing or underfilling of the scaphoid to achieve anatomical correction. And uh, you need to have a computer with or be a computer with yourself to use Minix or a similar kind of, um, of uh, computer software to have this um, uh, osteotomy correction. And this is the workflow of the whole surgery. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mack, for the very uh, interesting uh, way of uh, dealing with uh, scaphoid uh, non-unions, especially uh, using uh, technology. Thank you so much for the thank talk. You. Thanks, Andrew. Um, next, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Marian Brunner, our IWAS colleague from Lyon in France. She'll be uh, giving us uh, the evaluation of uh, hemic tip replacement for possible scaphoid non-union. Uh, Marian, to you. Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Can you see my screen and can you hear me? Yes, yeah, yes okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, no problem. Hello. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much for the, the invitation. And I would like to acknowledge my co author from Mayo Clinic. Um, so, my topic is proximal hamate graft for proximal scaphoid reconstruction. Um, first of all, let's have a look to this case. He's an 18-year-old patient. You can see the, uh, of course, the non-union of the proximal pole of the scaphoid. This is a, an avascular non-union and the fragmented uh, proximal pole. So uh, what are the options for this kind of young patient? Um, these are the different options we already know and uh, which have been uh, described. And uh, I will discuss a new option, which is the proximal uh, amate graft to reconstruct the proximal pole of the scaphoid when the scaphoid is fragmented. Uh, the first case was described by Dr. Ellison and Dr. Cracker from Mayo Clinic. And in the, the same young patient, they were, uh, they were able to achieve union and a good functional result with no pain at three years follow-up. The first question for this technique will be, uh, is there any bad effect on the carpal kinematics after removing the proximal uh, amate? That's why they performed the same team performed this study and they showed that there were no difference in carpal kinematics after removing the proximal amate. So the second question was, does the proximal amate graft to reconstruct the proximal pole of the scaphoid restore native carpal kinematics? And that's why my topic, we used eight fresh frozen mid forearm cadaver specimens all were lunate Vegas type 1, with, of course, no arthritis and no scaphoid abnormalities. Uh, we uh, use a specific pins to fix the sensor to the, to the different carpal bones we wanted to evaluate. Then we, uh, uh, we loaded the wrist flexors and extensor tendon, and we put uh, uh, the specimen into the specific frame, which were able to perform a cyclical motion. This is a wrist simulator. Then with uh, optoelectronic sensors, we use the Murray uh, phase tracking 3D motion to measure the different carpal ball motions. After uh, performing the scaphoid fracture, we reconstruct uh, the proximal pole of the scaphoid using the uh, proximal hamate. We harvest through a dorsal sparing approach. We harvest the proximal hamate. Then, as you can see, we pay attention to also harvest the volar capito hamate ligament. Then the proximal amate was flipped at 180 degrees to match uh, the shape of the proximal uh, pole of the scaphoid. 
uh, this is uh, the uh, screen after the screw fixation. And then we were able to repair uh, the scapholine ligament using the volar capital amate ligament. We evaluated the uh, intact wrist, then after performing the uh, proximal pole fracture, and finally uh, after the amate autograft. We measure the lunocapitate and the scapholine motion in wrist flexion extension and radio ulnar deviation. This is the statistical analysis. And now let's have a look to the result. First of all, there was no significant changes between the three conditions, considering the proximal row kinematics that occurs in a flexion extension. But in radial lunar deviation, the kinematics of the lunate and capitate was significantly modified after the creation of the proximal pole fracture, while the amide graft was able to restore carpal kinematics. The most uh, notable changes in carpal kinematics occurs uh, in the scapholine flexion extension and scapholine radial ulnar deviation along the wrist radio ulnar axis. As you can see in these conditions, uh, after performing the, the proximal pole fracture, there was a significant uh, change across the entire arc of the wrist radial ulnar deviation axis. This changes is consistent with previous studies. But after performing uh, the graft, you can see that uh, the graft was able to reproduce uh, the same condition as the intact wrist. Of course, there are some limits of this technique because it is a non-vascularized graft, but also some advantages because it is the same donor site and you can reconstruct the scaphoneulinate ligament by the same uh, surgery. Uh, one of the main concerns could be uh, the match between the proximal amate and the proximal pole of the scaphoid. For that, we have uh, uh, to these two studies. The first one uh, from Dr. Wu in 2018, and uh, they compared proximal pole of the scaphoid and proximal amate, and they uh, reported a match in uh, almost 70% cases. And a more recent study from Dr. Kaka and the team, and they also uh, observed in 10 patients that the maximum distance between the two uh, bones, after matching them with a CT scan, was 4.1 millimeter. And there is now some recent clinical series, a small one, of course, it is about four patients, and you can see that they achieve union in all patients at 14 months follow-up, uh, despite a mean delay after injury of uh, seven years and uh, a proximal pulse caffeine non-union with avascular uh, necrosis. So to conclude, the proximal amate graft of uh, the proximal pole of the scaphoid can restore carpal kinematics and can be an alternative for fragmented proximal pulse scaphoid non-union. Thank you very much, and uh, please, uh, uh, we will be happy to uh, see you in the virt virtual Lion Race course uh, in September. Thank you very much, Mario. It's a nice idea and a nice lecture. I invite next speaker, is Esper. Professor Wang is also come from the Taiwan. He serves uh, in Taipei, particularly in General Hospital. He's the director of the Division of Hand Surgery. He gave a talk about the ultra school treatment for proximal scale for non union. The Professor Wang, please. Thank you very much. And my topic is about uh, the scaphoid unit school physician and the uh, ultra school bone graft for the proximal pole non union of scaphoid. And there are some challenge cases of uh, scaphoid non union. Uh, yeah, Professor Wang, do you share your screen? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Can you see that? Yeah, it's okay. Okay. There are some challenging case of scaffold in our union especially ABN and proximal pole and the distal pole fracture and a failed previous surgery with school retention. But today our topic is about the scaphoid proximal pole non-union. There are some debates, uh, scope or open 
factorize on graph or non factor on graph, and head is full or KY, and therefore grade or integrate. So we choose uh, scope and uh, non factor on graph, and the head is full, uh, a limit school physician for treatment of a uh, script for possible corner union. Just like a lot of technique, and the, the, the technique or the physician is the same, just like the same with compression. This is from the case, the 21 case is from my mentor, Dr. Xu. We, and the type 1 and the type 2 straightforward nine units meet our uh, criteria because the, the plasma pole of nine units, the, the bone fragment is very tiny. So under the scope, we divide the, the fragile size and we use the temporal KY fixation to correct the DC. And under the other scope, we fill the gap with the bone graft and use the uh, screw to fix the scape of unit. So in, uh, in 21 case, there are two case failures. I fail to uh, heal it and finally go to four corner fusion. But the other case uh, has good luck. In the case one, it's a 32 female. Uh, is a scaffold plasma polar union with species for uh, even months. You can see the uh, it's a plasma polar union over here and, and with species deformity. So on the upper scope, uh, we do a divide bone graft and use the uh, ABCS screw to fix the scaffold unit. And we also do the radio dilation. So after one year of follow up, the first side already here. This is the case two, uh, scaffold plasma polar union. It's a 19 years old female. It's a scaffold, uh, with a DC for eight months. So, how to fix? Fastware bone graft or non fastware bone graft? Screw or pay wipe because, uh, the, the, the fragment is very small. So, we want, uh, integrate or retrograde. And uh, we also need to reduce, uh, the unit for the DC deformity. So on the other scope, we deploy the fracture side and fill the bone graft and use the uh, ATC screw screw to fix the scaffold unit. After six months, we the fracture side will be healed, so we remove the screw. The uh, range of motion is very good. So after three years, uh, uh, this baby was very satisfied with, the, with her beautiful wrist. This is a 28 and this is a scaffold plasma pole for each of the breaking nine union. It was noted as the removal imprint. Initially, he used the uh, mini plate to fix, but nine unit happened. So we removed the, the imprint. In the same way, uh, we use the arthroscope uh, to deploy the further side and use the bone graft to fill the gap and use the uh, screw to fix the scaffold unit. And after six months, we find that the further side will heal. But uh, we suggest the patient to uh, remove the screw, but the patient uh, didn't want to have surgery anymore. A discussion. So, this is from my, uh, my mentor, Dr. Wolf's paper. He said the plasma pore and uh, union is very likely to have impaired particularity, but in function it's there. So, he said the surgical key is deployment and the non particular bone graft. And uh, you say factorized bone graft is still then required. And you know, my, my other work also has a paper about uh, use the integrated screw fixation for the plasma pole scaffold. He finds that he has two cases uh, of isogenic fracture due to the strike, and uh, due to the trace tracer. So this technique for screw fixation for scaffold lunate for plasma pole union has, has some advantage. Because uh, it's a uh, rich fixation and higher union rate and better range of motion, especially the fraction. And we can avoid the secondary, secondary fracture of the plasma pole. And if each case have some associated scaffold lunar injury, like gas one or gas two, we can also fix because maybe the one screw maybe, uh, maybe solve two problems. I will suggest uh, the moon of school. Uh, to prevent the windshield wiper effect. So the, the key for the scaffold lunate, uh, physician is 
we uh, use the autoscope degree and bone graft. And this is a one shot operation. It's some, um, it's a technique demanding. Maybe in the future we can use a robot, like robot technique to, uh, to have a quick, more uh, accurate one, uh, one shot. And uh, the school need to, uh, the KP need to, uh, cross a uh, scape and the uh, unit center. So we center to center. So we need to uh, approach scape and units, double cortex. The school need be, uh, longer as possible to reach the arm corner. And if the patient has, the case has a disc deformity, the lunate uh, need to reduce. So we are very lucky in uh, this case. Uh, this, uh, this series are published in the uh, uh, BMC, a uh, journal of BMC. And the other, we also published in the journal of hand surgery. So special thanks to my mentors uh, for my uh, fellowship training overseas. Professor Maturin and Professor Wu and Professor Chen Shani and uh, Professor Shiretian and uh, Dr. Pishi Ho. Uh, uh, we will, uh, I and Dr. Xu will organize uh, FOI in 2024 in Taipei. We welcome all the FOI friends to join us to enjoy the Grand Hotel and the mountain climbing and bridge cycling and the LPG of course. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wang. Uh, enjoy your talk very much on this very innovative technique of yours. Uh, next, I would like to invite uh, none other than uh, Professor Christoph Matulan, who does not need introduction. Everybody knows him. He's a founding uh, founder of uh, EWAS, was a precursor of the now IWAS, and uh, he's also uh, one of the uh, distinguished uh, honorary members for this uh, APUA. So we'd like to welcome him. Uh, with pleasure to talk on uh, arthroscopic interposition tendon arthroplasty for slag risk. Uh, Christoph. Hello, my friend. Uh, I'm really happy to, to be here with you. Uh, I am currently in Corsica and uh, my internet uh, is not very stable, so I hope it, uh, everything will be okay. So uh, I hope to see you rapidly in Korea, maybe at the beginning in November, maybe in Shanghai uh, in November. And I remind you that we continue the face-to-face -face course to Strasbourg. And I hope to see most of you uh, next November course and next February course. So uh, I would like to discuss about the atroscopic interposition atroplasty. You know that in slack there is different stage in the, and the, the classical treatment are very aggressive uh, in slack two and slack three. It's why we propose the atroscopic technique uh, which we, we, we consider that uh, very simple is a styloidectomy, the simple styloidectomy as usual. But uh, after that, we remove the cortical bone of the scaphoid forcea of the radius, uh, hoping the creation of bleeding and uh, with this bleeding, uh, uh, an uh, natural soft tissue atroplasty. Then after that, we put an absorbable anchor into the radius uh, styloid, uh, like that. And we harvest the palmaris longus, which is the right perfect uh, tendon for the atroplasty. We use the technique I described for stabilize, not repair. Of course, you imagine at this stage, is not uh, we don't have any possibility to repair the scaphoid. Yet we would try to to stabilize the gap between the scaphoid and the lunate with the technique, and for that we use another anchor in the proximal pole because uh, at this stage classically there is no remnant uh, tissue in a scaphoid in order to stabilize the capsule and uh, the the scaphoid Then. The current technique is uh, to use one strip dorsal as an immune position technique described by Michel Levadou and one strip volar intraarticular ulnar to the long radiolinate ligament. You see the principle of the technique here, the tendon path from the, the, the one, two portal to the three, four, then behind the dorsal capsule and in front of the extensor tendon, enter, uh, we enter into the, the 6R portal 
and we're retrieving the one two for the second uh, the volar uh, strip is exactly the same uh, technique uh, uh, and at the end we create a, a core uh, a, a mass dress and uh, the 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 scaphoid so you see the midterm result retrospective study the salvage procedure of course we operated the 72 patient majority of male the age is uh, the average age is uh, 60 years old and the unknown fracture uh, in uh, 61 uh, unknown trauma excuse me in 61 cases we have a majority of slack 2 and we tried to operate uh, slack 3 but the result is not very good so you see it is a classical uh, uh, indication, a uh, very beautiful uh, slack two with a big gap, but the rest of the, the joint is safe. And uh, here, the placement of the of the, the anchor, you, you see the tendon uh, uh, into the joint. And you see after six years, of course, is not perfect, but we have so created the space between the scaphoid and the renate, and we stabilize the scaphoid renate dissociation, so it means that the patient continue to have a not so perfect range of motion, but uh, is very happy because it's painless. The average follow-up uh, is uh, uh, almost uh, six years now, and uh, you see that uh, uh, according to the, the pain, it's very interesting. Of course, the range of motion is not perfect and the strength is better, but not uh, very, very incredible. Uh, we published uh, the result with Margareta Ariani in arthroscopy uh, with the first uh, longer follow-up with more than two years. And uh, you see this case, pre-operative, post-operative, and you see the creation of a big, big uh, uh, space. We had uh, temporary inflammatory reaction in 10 cases at the beginning of our experience because we used the PLA. We believed at this period that the PLA could be a solution, simplest for the patient, but in fact, uh, it doesn't work. And uh, it creates, uh, you see, nine inflammatory reaction on 40 cases. So it's, it's very uh, uh, bad and we uh, abandoned uh, this technique. We have uh, six failures. You see this case, preoperative, uh, and uh, I was uh, not so uh, happy, but it was not so bad. And after five months, it's a big failure. So we have two failures in Slack 2 and four in Slack 3. We, of course, uh, the cosmetic result is very good. So it is my first patient. He's a 60 years old, uh, former trial motocross champion, current coach of uh, of uh, uh, European champion. And uh, you see, after 12 years of follow-up, uh, he had a, a good, uh, a, a, a curious aspect, uh, I agree with you, but uh, the nature is stronger than us, and uh, he found a solution. And he sent me his picture. Now he's uh, 75 years old. And uh, he continued to, 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 to perform the motocross. And uh, he told me that he had some minor pain after three hours of technique. So uh, the arthroscopic interposition in Slack 2 is a salvage procedure, of course. It seems to be not a so bad operation as a classical uh, uh, tendon interposition. And uh, it was always curious to know that uh, when we return for a different reason, we found the normal tendon inside the joint. So probably the environment of the synovial protects the tendon, but uh, it's very convenient for the patient. The palmaris longus is the right implant. Of course, we need a, a longer follow-up, uh, more than 10 years to uh, to consider this operation as a valid salvage option. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope to see you rapidly. Thank you, Professor Madurin. So nice lecture. The last topic uh, is uh, uh, also school measure of the snake. I have to invi invite the Inva, the old friend. He is the head of the Department of Plastic Hand Surgeon. Hamburg Hospital, Germany. He is the past president of FISH. Eva. Yes, hi. Hello. Thanks to uh, invite me. I'm happy to be here. And I will start my presentation. 
It's okay for you? You can see it? Yeah, it's okay. Yes, okay. Uh, the computer is running now, now right? <laughs> okay, it's okay. It's okay now? Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Greetings from IBAS. So, atroscopic management for SNAC mostly has already uh, said. So, we can use it for diagnostic and staging of SNAC uh, to check also the ligamented stages and see if we have already some osteoarthritis and where it is already gone. For treatment option, we have uh, atroscopic synovectomy and denovation if we want so, a debridement and radial cellulectomy, atroscopic assisted partial wrist fusion, or atroscopic assisted proximal rocapectomy. So the partial wrist fusion or proximal rocapectomies or salvage procedures are mostly in slack and snack. In my hand, more in slack than in snack, but now we want to talk about the snack. So what is the goal? We want to maintain range of motion and function with an acceptable pain. There is also some papers of, uh, for atroscopic uh, proximal rocapectomy, but they are not that much. For most of us who are going in open procedure, Ricardo Lucchetti promote and Palmer approach. He said there is permit all re uh, rehabilitation and faster recovery. This is a paper about atroscopic proximal rope. What I'm doing is a synovectomy, atroscopic uh, cutting of ligaments as much as possible with the help of beaver plate or sharp tip of the needle, two small open approaches for resection of the first row. Dorsal ulnar remove, uh, for the dorsal ulnar, uh, remove lunate and tricotum in the first step and a palmer for remove the scaphoid. Okay, now my computer don't. Yes, this is a case of Keenberg disease, um, but you also can use it in a snack. Here you can see the CT scan with a fractured lunate, and here you can see the cutting with the needle, uh, the sharp tip of the needle of SL ligament, LT ligament, and then you can remove the three bones like you can see upside. And this is the result. Uh, there's another patient with a snack, and you can see the functional results uh, six months post op with acceptable scars, and another case here. So, this is my way to go for proximal rocapectomy. And uh, this is the, what we can do for sure in stage three. We only can go for partial or total wrist effusion. We can achieve very good results with that, and we can in, have it in same in open and atroscopic surgery, but for that, we need a solid bony fusion and a good reduction. And it depends not on the resection of the pin. So we need to open up the, uh, the bone, maintain a good bone stock and bone craft to fill up the surfaces if we need so, and a stable osteosynthesis. We can use an open procedure flower plate or screw wires, and for sure, an atroscopic assisted. We cannot use plates. For the good reduction, we need to, the DC, to remove the DC deformity. It depends also on the type of lunate for the radial ulnar translation, and we I prefer a slightly overcorrection of DC. It gets more extension of the wrist and no overcorrection of ulnar translation. So this is what we can expect. It's a 3030 uh, extension flexion, better functional is 4020, and a reduction of the pain. And Palmer already told us that a 13 or 15 is uh, enough for functional wrist motion. And a comparison of darts rose motion or uh, regarding uh, RSL fusion, four corner fusion, and proximal rocopectomy gives no differences in these uh, three types. Um, this is uh, here we can look for the lunate type 1 or 2, and we can see a lot of people have a slight type 2 and no overcorrected. If we put the lunate directly on the capitate, we get a more stiff wrist. This is a case, and here was the after four corner fusion. And for sure, you can do a denovation uh, as well. Um, in my in open procedures, most of us do it in the same time. And in atroscopic procedure, you don't do it. And I don't see in atroscopic or open procedures a difference for pain at rest or at work. So it doesn't depend on the pin resection. For the arthroscopic procedure, you need a resection of the mid-couple joint and a removal of the scaphoid with a burr or for a mini open approach, arthroscopic transplantation of the bone craft and percutaneous screwing. So this is my technique I do. I go very fast and you can find it in multiple applications. Resection MC arthroscopic uh, with the overbore, it helps it go faster. 
Here you can see it on the right side. It's a bigger chip, so you can remove go very fast for that. And you need some bleeding for sure in the bones that you can heal afterwards. And then you go for an excision of the scaphoid. It's what I'm doing from our radiopalmer approach. Here you can see the scaphoid. And meanwhile, you do the reduction. Your scrub nurse can uh, prepare the scaphoid for the reduction and temporary transfixation. Go in a maximal flexion of the wrist and ulnar reduction so you can reduce the lunate very well. Here's preparing the bone craft. Put a urinary catheter in the scaphoid hole to prevent uh, bone chips falling down there. Here's the bone chips are coming in. And like Michel proposed us to fill these tubes, pre-fill them, then the cancellous bone crafting is very, very fast. It takes maybe five minutes that you have all the craft in. Then you can re-advance the second key wire, open tourniquet, and do the final osteosynthesis, what can be the most difficult part of the technique. Of the procedure. So for the osteosynthesis, you can go with key wires or screws. The key wires from the screws are very soft, and so I go with 1.4. If he's sitting perfect, replace them with a smaller one for the screw to lower screw over. If not perfect, but good enough, leave it and go for the next one. So you can go for key wires or screws, and you can mix also screws and key wires. Here you can see a case of mixture of them, or here only key wires. Uh, I do uh, like it goes the easiest way. Sometimes the capitate is uh, very corrupt and it becomes difficult to put the screws. Here you can find the details from the technique, post up six weeks cost or thesis, and then beginning of active motion out of the cost two or three weeks post up. CT scan in every patient after six weeks for bony healing if up for the osteosynthesis directly post up. Uh, here is a result four weeks post up, and there's a result six weeks post up, six months post up. Very good functional results and no scars or very few scars. Now the patient he had a generation elsewhere before. Six months post up. So it's a not that easy procedure, especially in the first time you have uh, some complications in my own series for the first 20 patients and one in the other 30 cases. And this was reported also from a group from let's see, uh, three of six patients uh, required free operation. So it's technically demanding and has a learning curve. We need to take care for the osteosynthesis not to protrude in the carpal tunnel. This is not visible in the OR if you have not a 3D CT uh, in the OR. I don't have, so be very careful. Attention to the PT joint as well, but this you can uh, check more easily. Key wire or screw, I don't see any differences. Even in this paper, there was uh, the benefit from the plates, but um, uh, for me, uh, key wires makes the same result. So why doing an atroscopic is technical demanding. Our time is a bit more, longer than in open procedure. Um, we have a better bony healing and a better range of motion, and the early beginning of exercise is maybe not a important but the quality for that is good so less cost of swelling and pain for the people and uh, better bony healing so regarding the quality and for the atroscopic part of this it's upper thanks a lot and vielen dank thank you very much eva well, it was a wonderful talk I would like now to open the floor to questions for the faculties and speakers, if any. Can I ask a question? Yes, you are. Okay, to Marianne. Yes. Hello. Uh, it was a very uh, interesting idea, but uh, my concern is that, uh, you know, the there is a helical motion between a uh, hamate and tracheate which leads to the uh, volar subluxation of the tracheatrum during the honor deviation. It's the role of the hamate. So how large can you get the fragment without hampering this motion? Yes, thank you for the question. Yet, of course, this is the main concern about this technique. And uh, that's why, uh, there, there was this uh, previous uh, kinematic study 
Um, actually, we harvest uh, almost four millimeter, four to five millimeter of the, the proximal amate. This was uh, sometimes pretty big when you are harvest uh, this. And we did not observe kinematical uh, changes. But of course, we probably need a further study and we probably also need to study the loading and not only the kinematics. Uh, but so far, there was uh, there was no um, kinematics changes. But thank you for the question. Thank you. Can I ask a question, Eva? That was a very nice talk. You covered a, a lot there. You talked about using the the sharp needles to cut the capsule off the bone. Can you go through that in a bit more detail? How you do that? Because that must be an important step to be able to do an arthroscopic proximal row carpectomy. So you, you must get the alignment of that right. And can you just explain a bit more how you might do that? Yes. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, at the beginning, I tried to use a beaver plate or a, a 11 um, plate. But uh, the problem is to, to enter in the joint safely and, and come back uh, not to cut uh, the tendons and so on. And so with the tip of the... Um, the needle, um, it's uh, this is very sharp, and you also can curb it. So it means you can also on the dorsal side, um, and you can enter very safely. And it's um, I do a lot of uh, percutaneous needle fester to me in Dipitran, and maybe the idea is coming from from this point. And these needles are very sharp, and you can take uh, several ones. So you can cut the. Um, the SL and LT ligament, this is easy because it's just in front of your 3, 4 and 6 R portal and to go on the dorsal side um, you can curb it. If you want to cut on the palmar side as well you need a palmar portal but uh, when you go then for the open uh, removal um, you can cut this uh, at this moment as well. For the scaphoid you can cut the ST ligaments because you write your palmal and for the dorsal side um, it's a little bit more tricky uh, but it's also possible with a normal life then. Yeah, that's a question. Yes, PC. Uh, same for Eva. Um, Thank you very much for bringing the needle. It's another instrument I like very much. I did also use a lot of needle. Uh, my question is about the PRC again. Uh, the rehabilitation. Uh, I want to know what is your rehabilitation plan after your mm -hmm. arthroscopic PRC, usually. What is my what? Rehabilitation. So uh, do you immobilize the wrist or do you allow early mobilization? No. So what uh, I, I do, uh, they have just uh, a kind of orthesis for the first, uh, I will say, uh, two weeks or three weeks, it depends on the on the pain. You need uh, also, like an open procedure, some time that the other soft tissues can uh, contract a little bit uh, because it's too, too, too movable at the first moment. But they can um, um, be in active motion as soon as they feel comfortable with it. Well, I absolutely agree because I, I, in fact, I just want to share echo this idea I've got. When I performed the PLC some years ago, um, I also with a wish that um, I hope it can be a different from an open procedure because of the minimal invasive technique, you don't open the skin. Theoretically, you can start the motion much earlier because most people doing an open PLC prep will start motion, say, after six weeks or so hmm. before the cut revert. But I'll, later on, I find uh, this is not applicable. Because as you mentioned, uh, after we remove the first row, there's the too much laxity for the soft tissue. If I start the motion too early, in fact, the patient will experience more pain during the process. So much that I have to slow down the rehabilitation, I have to re-mobilize the patient again. So after some case, I, my, my conclusion that even you can perform a prosopic PLC, you may not reach the purpose of the, reaching the goal of early mobilization because the the nature would not allow, not allow you to do so. You still need to have the ligament to, to stiffen up. Perhaps you take around six to eight weeks to do so before you can actually start the motion. So I think uh, for this reason, I, I it becomes less attraction for me to do a PLC with the arthroscopy. Yes, I, I, in the, to do it in real arthroscopy, I think it's too much time consuming to go with a burr for it. So uh, this is, a, I would say, a mixture. This a minimal invasive approach because you need to make less scarring on the on the soft tendons around, mm -hmm. uh, soft tissues around, sorry. Sure, sure. I have a question for uh, Wang Jun, Junpan and, uh, of course, uh, my co-chair, uh, Wei Tian. 
uh, this is regarding your procedure. It's almost like uh, doing a uh, this uh, bone grafting of the non-union site and uh, Russell procedure or slam procedure by Jeff Yao and uh, Melvin Rosenwasser. How do you actually uh, ensure that you know uh, you actually fire at the correct axis between the scaffold and the lunate? Because uh, usually the complications have been described uh, for a slam or a Russell procedure uh, about this uh, screws uh, not 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 at the right axis and uh, you know uh, causing uh, future complications. Any tips and tricks? My mentor, uh, Professor Xu Chen, in support. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, from because uh, from the middle, middle cover joint just curve. We can monitor how about the scaffold lunate joint al alignment. So when we put the bone graph around the fracture side, actually we also see the scaffold lunate joint. So we can maintain the congruity. And uh, after that, yeah, we template a, a fixation and uh, we apply the screw with a uh, Russell method that can con continue maintain the uh, congruity of the scale lunate joint. Thank you. Thank you. One follow-up question. I always uh, find things is difficult to remove the screw after six months. How can you find a hole? <laughs> <laughs> it's quite traumatic to find a yeah, hole. Maybe a little bit lucky. You <laughs> 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 have to find a hole, yeah. I, I have... I have a, a, an answer. You know, okay. it is uh, the, the the modification of the arthroscopic bone grafting I propose for the uh, the proximal pole, uh, placing cow wires from uh, scaphoid to uh, to lunate. When I use the technique of uh, Melvin Rosenwasser uh, to put the screw uh, between the scaphoid and the lunate, the yeah. trick I I had to or to find the screw after is to uh, put a uh, uh, a cow wire inside the screw and to cut it. After that, you find re really easily the, <laughs> the, the the screw. I see, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So you leave the K wire. You leave the K wire with the screw. Oh, yeah, cow wire in, <laughs> in, inside the screw. Yeah. Very, yeah. very, uh, just uh, one two millimeter. But you you feel with your with the, the tip of your finger and uh, you yeah, can yeah. Find that's a, that's a very good trick. Thank you so much. Not so difficult. Yeah. Do you have time to discussion? Um, well, the, the question is, uh, is that uh, any any more questions from from the speaker or from the any question from the the, the YouTube? I'm not sure. Uh, Liu Po, can I ask you a question? Is there extra cost for patients undergoing a robot procedure in your country? <laughs> this we we're, we're planning. We're planning. Yeah, actually, for for the uh, we we're talking about the uh, screw removal uh, from the coppers. So actually, we also use the robot to, to help us to to find the exact way to 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 re remove the, the the screw. So we we have tried uh, a couple of cases, which is uh, we have saved the surgeon a lot of time, a lot of uh, X ray exposure. I think it's also a uh, alternative for for this. Yes. Procedure. Have you taught the robot to reduce the fracture yet? <laughs> Have you taught the robot to reduce the fracture? No, no, no. no that's I, the hard bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, uh, that's a future. That we actually we are we are doing the research on how uh, robot can help us to reduce the fracture as well. So yes, but uh, I, but I think it's a removal of screw is also a, a indication for the robot. Yeah. It, it, in, in fact, I want to comment. I, I actually echo very much to Paul. Removal of a screw in the scaphoid can be one of the most difficult surgery in the wrist surgery. I, I recall one of my kids, I used three hours to remove the previous, uh, somebody placed uh, a bloody screw inside the scaphoid. But I have to remove it because it's non healing. Don't have to remove but it takes so much time. So I, 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 it can be there too. So that's why whenever, who, whoever I want to place a screw in the scaphoid, you have to make sure that. <laughs> You can you have a way to remove it uh, subsequently. That's actually related to one question to Julio because you mentioned the double screw technique, and I, it seems to me <laughs> you always go through the uh, trapezium as you propose. But I will say that um, 
would that be difficult to remove afterwards? And also, uh, would that be produce some sort of STT joint arthritis? Because if you routinely do that, uh, would that be one concern? <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, actually, I've never experienced uh, the the removing the screws after all the so surgery, so I cannot answer your question. But uh, the second thing is the scapular trapezoid arthritis. There is a article in the literature that uh, uh, although uh, there are the trans uh, trapezoid approach, uh, there is a not significant uh, uh, arthritic. Uh, changes after all, after several years. So <laughs> I have never experienced, I, I never have any problems with the uh, scap trapeze joint with my uh, procedures. Surgeon never say never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Let's see we have happens. a question from the YouTube, uh, from Re Rebecca Ling. So her, her question is about, what about using bio by degenerate, uh, degeneratable uh, screws. I, I, I believe this question is for also for for uh, June Pan and uh, uh, Ritian. Yeah. yeah. But How I about the uh, sorry about screw? Yeah, well, uh, it's available in Taiwan, but I still now I have no any experience about that. Have anyone have used the such a screw? Yeah, I've uh, used it for two you? cases. Yeah, I've, I've experienced the magnesium screw. Magnesium yeah. screw. That's right. I've tried. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, quite successful. But it takes about nine nine months uh, for the screw to disappear. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew, so you you use this screw for for what for scaphoid fracture? Yeah, or? for scaphoid fracture as well as scaphoid non-union. Yep. Yeah. So what what what's the uh, what uh, what what the uh, what is the uh, material for the for the screw? Magnesium. Ah, magnesium. Okay. And in how many months does it? Uh about about nine months before the screw starts to uh, you know denature and uh, disappear. Okay. You have no resection um, uh, bone dissolution problems because in in Germany they showed us some yes. uh, not that uh, encouraging results and they are more or less yeah. disappearing from so, the market uh, here in Germany. I had a, I had a, quite a I would say quite a I would say quite a traumatic experience because uh, the first six months it looks as though the the, 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 the fracture was not united. Then uh, lo and behold at nine months when the screws start to disappear then you see the fracture heal. <laughs> so mm -hmm. for the first six months mm -hmm. there was actually uh, some gas, uh, some hydrogen gas being released so you you look as though there's some uh, lucency there. So it actually uh, obscures the your 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 uh, the the bone healing process. Yeah. And you do think this uh, absorbable screw is uh, mechanically is uh, is uh, sufficient for for scaphoid fracture. I think if uh, if it's fixed properly, you allow the, the the fracture to heal within the the the, the correct timing. Of course, uh, it should it should it should heal. But of course, if it's going to be delayed union, that's where the problem may actually potentially arise. Then the, the strength of the screw may actually deteriorate. Yeah. The the thing that worries me about all these things like magnesium screws is we don't know where the magnesium goes. If it goes in the liver or into the brain or into the heart muscle. I just think stainless steel is pretty good. We've been using it for a while. We know that's safe. Eva, have you got a comment on that? Because I know a lot of that came from Germany. Have they done all the studies on the safety? Is there any issues with that? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. Uh, yes, there are some measures, but I'm not sure if there are some pa uh, papers. But I know from the from the market and from they are more or less gone because uh, more of the the um, resorption of the bone. There was, um, in, at least in the small bones, it looks not that um, encouraging. I'm not sure if they are still available, but uh, the, the publicity they have done is, is uh, very much reduced now. So it seems to be uh, no more there. But I can have a look at that. <laughs> Okay. If, if we have no more questions, probably uh, every speaker we just open our camera and uh, take a group picture. Gloria, can you help us to take a group picture? Yes. Okay, yeah. I can have that. Please turn on your video. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Do 
Cheese. Cheese. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Warren. Huh? Okay. So, so. Okay, finish. Oh, okay, okay. So, Thank you. So Thanks, Let's welcome the, our uh, President Toshi Nakamura to, to ending this session. Yeah, thank you very much for join, joining uh, this uh, sad webinar of the Asia Pacific, Asia Pacific Research Association. Uh, I actually enjoyed the great talks, uh, which was uh, wide respect in the, the couple of pathologies. Then uh, I think that everyone uh, yeah, understand this one very well, more deeply, and that uh, we're going to meet in that uh, next November in uh, Shanghai and also in a hybrid style. So see you next Thank you time. So, thank you so much for the organization. It was well perfect. Yes. See you in thank November. You. Thank you, Bye -bye. Our friend Bye -bye. from Bye -bye. Europe, from thank Iowa. You. Thank you, the friend from Europe and Iowa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. right. See you again. See you all. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. November. Bye. November. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Take Stay care. safe. Bye bye. Bye. Stay safe. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.